Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report. And, of course, we always have remarkable guests coming up. Uh, we have Gary Creep, attorney, who has been involved with that uh, suit regarding the Marine, who uh, the Marines were trying to remove him from the Marines because of comments on a private uh, uh, page um, against uh, comments made against uh, the usurper-in-chief of the White House, Mr. Obama. And uh, the latest actions, of course, on the National Defense Authorization Act injunction. Gary Creep is involved intimately in that injunction nationally against the federal law that Obama kept on apologizing he wouldn't sign, but he did sign it. And that abomination has been injuncted and to stop the indefinite detention of American citizens. Uh, Gary, give us an update on the Marine and then on this NDAA injunction that you uh, were able to put in place and put a stop to. Uh, the indefinite detention of American citizens. Certainly. Gary Stein has been kicked out of the Marine Corps. They removed him under less than honorable circumstances. We had filed a lawsuit. Uh, I was the lead counsel working with a number of uh, uh, legal groups around the country. Uh, the judge, unfortunately, took the position that she thought the Marines would do the right thing and would never kick him out, so she wasn't going to stop them from doing it, and she kept saying on and on. She hoped that they would do the right thing, and then they basically told her to stick it in her ear. There's some very derogatory comments about the federal courts uh, during the actual, what they call the ADSEP hearing, the administrative separation hearing, and the uh, it turned out that one of the Marine Corps officers had outright lied to the court, but she won't do anything about it, the, the federal court judge. So now we're in the process of amending the complaint to seek reinstatement, and Gary Stein is uh, trying to uh, get work, uh, Doing whatever job he can because he's got a, a, a pregnant wife uh, and a small dot and a small child, uh, so uh, he's struggling financially. And so we're uh, my foundation is trying to uh, contact people to see if we can help him get some work just to survive. Exactly. Yeah. What is your website and foundation, uh, Gary? Uh, usjf.net that's our group's called United States Justice Foundation so it's our initials usjf.net and if somebody in the Southern California area has a, a job for Gary if they could just send me a, go to the website and send me an email I'll pass it on to him and hopefully we'll find him some employment Yeah, I think um, Gary had a background in training in, in, uh, in meteorology so he's actually a meteorologist he could work for a weather service he could work for a uh, television station uh, he could work for uh, the uh, an airline industry where actually they need to know the weather uh, for flights coming in and out of airports. He has all these areas of expertise. Yes, yes. I mean, he he did uh, almost nine years in the Marine Corps. He was a sergeant. Uh, you know, he said some perhaps indiscreet things about Mr. Obama, but the context which the military keeps ignoring, which the media keeps ignoring, because, of course, they want to kiss up to Mr. Obama, is that his comments were made in the context of saying that uh, he would not obey an order to uh, uh, disarm American citizens and round them up for uh, internment under the uh, indefinite detention provisions of NDAA, which Mr. Obama signed in January. I mean, that's right. the context. Uh, but the media just says, oh, he said terrible things about Obama on the on Facebook. Well, you know, the truth is often something different than what the uh, media would have. Well, uh, yeah, it, it's important to have the proper context. Uh, the NDAA Act has not gone away. The announcement a few weeks ago that they're going to deploy 200,000 drones over American soil, I know that Alex Jones has put on his program that he's actually gone down with his friends that are actually doing what I call practice shoots on video on his live stream uh, on his TV channel, I guess, uh, uh, PrisonPlanet.tv. It's quite humorous, actually, if you go over there, because I have a membership, and I applaud uh, Alex and the and the people that are actually down Texas saying they're going to take these out of the air if they actually fly over Texas airspace. Um, I think it's really ridiculous that we would have drones when we don't even protect our border with our military, where we are, you know, planning on deploying these over American soil. Why? Uh, what are you going to do? Watch people on the freeway? Are you going to have them come hovering right up to their home? Are you going to see them two miles away? What's the purpose of having these very expensive, high-powered, high-tech drones over American uh, airspace? Many of them could actually be weaponized with advanced missile systems and so on, just like they took out these so-called Al-Qaeda members in Yemen. Uh, this is very, very dangerous, especially when you combine the, the so-called baseball cards uh, death wish of Obama and determine that American citizens can be considered persona non grata if they consider you a potential enemy. You're no longer a citizen even. Well, as you may have seen, there was actually articles in the mainstream media 
uh, so about a month or four to six weeks ago talking about how the FAA is reserving airspace for drone traffic uh, over America where they would bar planes for fear of uh, collisions between the drones and the planes. So this is a pretty serious, so this is not just some theory, it's not some wide-eyed, you know, conspiracy type of thing. This is some but what are the airline industries going to do if they have a large, and these aren't small drones. Some of these drones are pretty darn big. Uh, one I heard reported was uh, that it crashed accidentally, I think, in the east coast up around uh, Connecticut or somewhere up there. It was around 24 feet across in its wingspan. These are fairly large uh, drones, you know, robotically flown drones, and they can actually, if they impact one of these large wide-body jets, they're going to take it out of the sky and hundreds of people are going to die. Well, I remember uh, TWA, the TWA flight that was uh, shot down off the coast of New York. There is a substantial, there's substantial belief that that was actually uh, done by a uh, military drone uh, that, uh, and it was all covered up because the White House didn't want to be embarrassed by the fact that it'll, that White House personnel were watching it when it was shut, uh, shot down. Uh, so, and, and I, I have a lot of involvement in that case because because of my relationships with uh, one of the defendants that was the federal government went after to shut up and harass. But getting back to the uh, NDAA, as uh, your listeners may know, uh, several weeks ago, a, new, a uh, federal district court judge in, for the Southern District of New York issued an injunction against implementation of the indefinite detention provisions of NDAA. Now, the amazing thing is this was an Obama-appointed federal district court judge, which, you know, if the liberals, if, if, the, if the lefties are scared of this, you know it's got to be bad uh, because uh, the, the, the... I think the, Sotomayor the, was the one who actually uh, came out against it, didn't she? I'm sorry? I think it was uh, Sandra Sotomayor who's out of one of his appointed federal judges actually came out against the, uh, the, the this whole issue of the NDAA, didn't she? I, I'm not aware of that, but uh, there's a one, the, the judge who issued it several weeks ago was an Obama-appointed federal district court judge. Yes. Yeah. During, yeah. During, during the hearing on, on the, the matter, and the case was brought by Chris Hedges, who's a liberal reporter for the New York Times and several other reporters, and they basically sued on the grounds that they're simply interviewing Taliban and al-Qaeda operatives and then publishing the interviews could subject them to the indefinite detention provisions. And so the judge asked the U.S. attorney uh, if, uh, if they could be arrested for simply doing their interviews, and the U.S. attorney's response was, quote, I can't tell you, unquote. So oh, the, no. judge, the judge issued, which is a pretty stupid thing to say to a federal court judge, the judge issued the injunction, and then the uh, federal government filed a motion to vacate the order. And they very arrogantly told the judge that she didn't have the power to issue the order, that she didn't understand the ramifications of the order. She couldn't have meant what she said. She didn't mean to say what she said. And uh, basically, uh, national security precludes her from being able to do that. And even if she could, she could only enjoin arrest of Chris Hedges and the other two named plaintiffs. The judges didn't, the judge didn't even have a hearing. She just issued an a, a order in response saying, I, I meant what I said. I knew what I said. I understand what I said, the, the uh, injunction is nationwide, uh, it involves everybody, you cannot take anybody into custody into this law, and yes, I do have the power to do it, and I'm doing it. So, but that was a big slap in the face to the Department of Justice, I mean, she didn't even hold a hearing, she just slapped them around with a written ruling in response to their motion. Now, how I got involved was that uh, Chris Hedges' attorneys had contacted uh, a group of constitutional law attorneys that I work with regularly, and so I, on behalf of the United States Justice Foundation, was brought into this, and I uh, was uh, I co-authored a brief on it with two uh, extremely intelligent, extremely good constitutional law attorneys, uh, Bill Olson and Herb Titus. Herb was the uh, original uh, uh, dean of the Regents Law School, and Herb was as an attorney in the uh, Reagan administration. Yeah, excellent, excellent. So we have some action, actually, uh, how can I say, neutralize the evil of this legislation. And Obamacare is coming up, I've heard, this week. We're going to hear about that. Maybe we can make a comment on it. But the NDAA Act has been temporarily at least neutralized.
Welcome back, and uh, let's plunge into the Obamacare thing. And there's some very important legal arguments, uh, Gary, attorney, uh, that we need to touch on. You mentioned this idea of severability. The whole issue that I've heard uh, from my sources, including AMAC, uh, Mr. Weber, of AMAC.us, the alternative to AARP, and uh, they're presenting information to uh, regarding to Ob- Obamacare this week to the government, to the Senate and Congress. <clears throat> the uh, severability issue and others issues, this is very serious. Obamacare is probably the most serious blow against the republic in American history, aside from the NDAA. Um, what's going to happen, uh, do you think? Well, my opinion has been that the individual mandate is toast because yeah. it's... It's unconstitutional. And the issue, and everyone seems to now acknowledge, there was a poll that said originally that only something like a third of all the former Supreme U.S. Supreme Court uh, clerks, the clerks of the various justices, thought that they would that they would blow uh, Obamacare out. And that's now or the individual mandate out. And now it's up to 57 percent after the uh, comments and arguments and questioning of the various judges. Even uh, Justice Sotomayor expressed. Uh, 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 a lack of support for Obamacare. So the individual mandate appears to be dead. Now the issue is, are they going to knock out the whole thing or are they just going to take out the individual mandate and leave all or parts of it there? Well, a couple of basic uh, things about law, at least from the Supreme Court's perspective. You can't sever a part of a bill out unless there's a what's called a severability clause. Now, the severability clause is a standard type of clause that's in bills and in the many contracts for that matter, which says that if part of this bill or contract is deemed to be uh, unenforceable by a court of competent jurisdiction, then the rest of it stands. Well, there was a severability clause in the original draft of Obamacare that came through Congress, and then uh, it was taken out. Uh, they purposely removed the severability clause. And there was a lot of discussion by Attorney General Holder and by other supporters of it uh, to Congress that without the individual mandate, you can't have Obamacare, period, because th- there's no money to fund it because of all the very things that they're doing. And uh, when the case came before the U.S. Supreme Court, Neither side wanted to argue for severability. So the court actually appointed an attorney to address the severability issue to the court. And I thought that that pretty much showed that neither side wanted or thought or wanted there to be a severing of the individual mandate, declaring that unconstitutional by itself, and then letting the rest of it hang because it would just make the whole thing unwieldy. There would be no money to implement the provisions. But now there's rumors floating around that the uh, individual mandate is going to go, but the rest of it is going to stay. That's and what I heard, too. That's, that's, a, that's a ridiculous situation, isn't it? Well, it it's, would be unprecedented because you're saying, okay, we're going to have all these mandates. We're not going to find any funding for them. So that, that's, in fact, an unfunded mandate, which is going to really wreak havoc financially. Oh, and, and destroy the health care. What will happen is trauma units, if you're on the freeway, the trauma unit will go bankrupt. Your family doctor will go bankrupt. The health care system will collapse. We have a 30% decrease in fees that's scheduled this year for doctors. And the ones that will be destroyed will be the, your family doctor, your pediatrician, your internist. The high-powered specialists, they'll start to go, too. They have these giant fees. They, the insurance companies won't pay them anymore. What will happen is you're going to see a lot of these subspecialists. That means that you have twice the chance of survival of a serious health problem in America as it stands right now. That's going to go. You're going to be dealing with third-world health care where a lot of the doctors will be forced into bankruptcy, forced right out of business, and hospitals and corporations and trauma units will just be gone. Well, there's, there's already been talk that if Obamacare is implemented, uh, there's rumors that as many as, according to some polls, as many as 40% of the doctors currently in practice would, would stop practicing because they just financially couldn't, couldn't Well, it's not it. a matter of, you don't even have a choice. I mean, a lot of them might say they have a choice, but to be honest with you, about a third of the doctors out there will be forced, oh, even against their will, to go to bankrupt. And what I've heard is if they're within four to five years of retirement, they can't afford to stay in practice because they'll literally be throwing their money into a black hole because they'll have to pay to stay in practice. Well, I, you're a lot more knowledgeable than that. I mean, my, my area of expertise, uh, to, to the extent that I have any any area of expertise, is uh, on the legal end. I mean, well, I, on, the, on the legal I, side, where, where do you think this will go? Because we have the situation now where we can see Obama sinking, okay? Obama, when he made his, his latest move, 
to, to not put a permanent response to this issue of, of children that have been born in America from, quote, illegals. We're not dealing with the issue that the most common illegals now are not from Mexico, but they're Asians that come here as students and they don't go home. Right. Uh, and, and we're not dealing with any of these things. And uh, we, we have Rubio and, and Romney are going to come up with a, with a plan. I think Rubio has been working on a plan for several years now. Obama tried to trump him by putting out this stupid response, which is a temporary staff guy that doesn't offer, even down the road, the possibility of applying through even seven years of getting citizenship. You don't want two classes of civilization. Either close your borders, manage it properly, and have a proper rationale for bringing people in. And when students come here from China, they should go home. They shouldn't be allowed to stay here indefinitely if they're not if their their mandate was to come over here and study and go back to China. Well, would you want to go back to China if you got the chance to get out? I mean, give me a break. It's it's yeah, addictive. It, it, yeah, I know, I know. I'm just, I'm putting that, that the thing in there. But then we have to have a pathway. If they're going to do that, are they going back because China is a totalitarian regime and it's a humanitarian? See, Obama doesn't want to go there. I don't even know if Romney does. That in fact, China is such a vicious regime that they would be allowed to come into America because of humanitarian uh, issues. And how many people were we let into America? I mean, literally because of these third world countries like Muslim countries where the Muslim Brotherhood are taking over in Egypt. Now that just happened. Uh, we could easily have in the next five or ten years another fifty or hundred million Americans. Easy, right? Easy, and and we're talking about not necessarily just bad people, but you know, highly qualified, educated, maybe even trained in America, right? Yeah, see if we can reconnect with uh, with uh, Gary, so we can finish this uh, dialogue. So it's quite an important issue to deal with because we don't see a response occurring that's going to be rational. Um, I want to hear some responses from the public out there, too. If you're listening, uh, call in 800-259-5791 for callers. 800-259-5791. 800-259-5791. We'll reconnect with Gary in just a moment. We want to hear what uh, what his response is in terms of we've got to have a, a rational plan that's actually going to deal with this issue rather than pretend it because China is a pretty aggressive regime. And whether we're going to deal with this issue or not is uh, is very serious. Um, ah, Gary, you're back. We lost our connection there. Yeah. So, uh, what what kind of response do you think we should do in order to take care of this issue? Um, my suspicion is that Rubio's plan is one that'll probably be one that Romney will will put forward as his response to Obama's uh, uh, trying to kind of trump uh, the dealing with this issue. Well, you're probably. You're probably right. I, I, Romney seems to be somewhat dumbfounded by this whole thing and doesn't seem to really be able to uh, enunciate a, a, a policy other than saying, well, I won't promise anything right now. And I heard that Rubio's got a pretty concrete plan, though, and his plan is one that has a pathway to citizenship that deals with the fact of uh, young, educated people. Now, I hear some people out there that say, we've got to close our borders and send all these people and deport them. I think that's irrational. But on the other hand, we have people that are coming into this country that have done one or two terms in the U.S. military that came from San Salvador or Guatemala that are now part of drug cartels, operations in Los Angeles and in Phoenix, and they need to be going to prison or be deported. There's a, okay. we, have, we don't have a rational plan that deals with students coming here and are going to be sent back to hell in China or elsewhere. When we come back, maybe we'll hear some uh, ideas on the legal side of it. And your response if you have questions, 800 259 5791. Call in for Gary Creek. You hear the story all the time. I know when I did occupational medicine in Colorado, I saw it all the time. And we're back with. Gary Creep, we lost our connection, we're back, and if you have any questions for Gary, the number 800-259-5791. Gary, what are the big issues that are coming up? We have, for this election, we've got Obamacare, we're going to know this week what the playing cards are, what's going to happen. And I think Obama, actually, if you just kind of look at it, the best asset right now for Obama is that that Romney doesn't come up with a cohesive set of policies on immigration, on the economy, on the Federal Reserve, and on supporting what I call an illegal intrusion to Syria and Iran, uh, which, of course, Obama basically, during the Tunisia and Libyan issues, said he was going to take his orders from NATO and the United Nations rather than from Congress. Uh, it's amazing to me that Obama has not already been impeached. I mean, I find it just remarkable 
that the impeachment process isn't going forward so that at least the Democrats can put forward a candidate that is, number one, an American citizen, and number two, actually has rational policies that won't destroy the United States. And uh, and then Romney needs to get a vice presidential candidate like Rubio moving forward to deal with some of these issues so that we can actually decide what we want. And we certainly don't want Obamacare. We do want some of the provisions like children up to 26 being able to get their insurance. We want affordable health care. We want to get rid of, and I put a number of recommendations uh, forward. First one is we want to get rid of state licensure and go to federal boards and they're not run by the government. We want to get rid of coding and pay doctors and health providers by their time they spend with people. We want to have a system that, that allows innovative health care uh, so that everybody gets affordable health care so we don't have big insurance companies or big government running it. We want it so it's uh, basically back to basics. Uh, we don't want all this foolishness and we don't want the health care system destroyed so all our good doctors either quit or are forced on, into, into financial retirement so that we can provide the care for our population that's getting older. Um, and we also want to make it a place where smart young people, the brain drain, was to America for decades, maybe last century. We want that brain drain to continue. We want to have smart people from all over the world say, the best place to live and to work and to innovate in the world is America. Well, I, I agree with what you're saying. I'm not sure where, where to start in response. I think that, uh, personally, uh, my opinion is that uh, Obama's uh, uh, going to win a re-election, uh, assuming that he's eligible to sit in the White House, which to me is a Yeah, I, I, I see that happening, too. In other words, you're on the same track as me, that uh, the best asset for Obama is Romney, because Romney doesn't have his Christian base because he's not a Christian. He's a Mormon, and uh, because he basically has the first Asperger's candidate for U.S. president. Well, I, I, I don't want to get into the Mormon Christian thing. I'd yeah, I know, but, I'm just, but he's not even a conservative Mormon. Most Mormons are so conservative that I'd vote for him if he was conservative Mormon, but he's not. Uh, we have a caller, Joe, in Ohio. He had a comment or question. Go ahead, Joe. You're on the air with Gary Creek. Yes, I've got a question for Gary. Um, I belong to a, um, mm, I'll tell you, a private uh, group here in uh, Ohio that has uh, endorsed Mitt Romney. And this uh, group also has a formal constitution that they have enacted. And in that constitution that they have enacted on their own now, okay, it says uh, basically they have a mission statement which says we will advance, uphold, defend the principles of liberty, justice, Bill of Rights, Constitution of the United States. And this is the line I'd like to pay attention to is, the mission statement is to elect to public office Republican candidates who demonstrate a commitment to these self-same principles. The question is, is there any legal recourse I can have against this group to not endorse um, Mitt Romney contrary to their mission statement, their constitution here? Is this a group that you voluntarily joined or is it a group that you're mandated to join? Voluntarily. Okay, well, uh, unfortunately, if they want to take an action, uh, first of all, depending on their status, if they're a 501c3 corporation, nonprofit corporation, they, they can't endorse. So no matter what their bylaws say, they can't. Uh, they're prohibited by the IRS. If they're, uh, uh, depending on what their, their legal status is, they may, uh, other than that, they may or may not be able to endorse. If it's, if you were mandated to pay dues to it and you were objecting to it, then you could, uh, file a lawsuit either to seek to block them or to at least, uh, have them, uh, re reimburse, uh, the dues of all people who would disagree with that because you can't be forced to support a political candidate against your beliefs under a variety of court decisions. But if it's a voluntary organization and if they're legally able to endorse, your only recourse really uh, is to withdraw from the organization. You can file a lawsuit. I, I just don't see you getting very far with it because the group is, so assuming they follow their own procedures, uh, then they are allowed, to, and assuming they legally can endorse, then they're allowed to endorse. The issue of whether Romney uh, believes one way or the other or supports one thing or another, unfortunately, it's not grounds to block such an endorsement. Yeah, that makes total legal sense. Uh, so I hope that answers your question, Joe. Um, this election, what do you think the key issues are going to be, Gary? Because this is uh, really starting to become quite a, uh, I say, a very difficult election in terms of what it's going to do to the American soul. 
uh, I see the same thing. I see a disputed election. I see lawsuits. I see them not even counting the votes and being certain as to who was actually elected until the end of November. I see lawsuits even next year about whether or not uh, Obama shouldn't have even been on the voter rolls of Arizona and other states. This is going to get very ugly, isn't it? I, I believe that it is. I think that Mr. Obama is planning to, uh, uh, his whole campaign is based upon class warfare and race warfare. Exactly. We, that, that's an <laughs> excellent comment. And we have Richard in Washington with a question for uh, Gary Creep. Go ahead. You're on the air. Yeah, as always, uh, Doctor, uh, your evaluation is great and, and uh, your, your uh, what, eva- uh, knowledge of the background to get that evaluation is great. But I have one question for Gary, and, and that's kind of the question that I brought up to you. If this country declared bankruptcy in 1933 with uh, the Emergency Banking Act under uh, pre- uh, President Roosevelt or elected, uh, selected Roosevelt, uh, and then under the uh, Amended War Powers Act of 1917, all of us were declared enemies of that corporation. The corporation was uh, put into re- receivership. I think it went to the board of the Federal Reserve uh, uh, people. If, if that's the, the case, uh, how is the courts, the president, or any of these things, uh, other more than elected officials of the corporation, or selected officials of the corporation, how can any of this stuff be in, in effect if we are in receivership? Wow, I don't even know where to begin with that one. Uh, I, uh, I mean, I've gotten into discussions with people before as to what, you know, there's, there's a whole theory about whether the federal courts are admiralty courts because they have to run the flag, whether they're civil courts. Uh, yeah, that's just, uh, I'm a constitutional law attorney, but uh, that's not an area I've ever gotten involved with, and, and uh, any comment I may might make uh, would not, uh, I don't think, have any validity because I don't have any, uh, haven't done any research into that issue. Well, I think one of the things that I would I would draw out as a, a principle is that the Constitution was actually the parties to the Constitution of the states. The Bill of Rights refers specifically to U.S. citizens. So the states, if they do not agree to this in a public way with a, with a proper poll of their, of their state populations, no agreement made unilaterally by the government without the agreement of the states can therefore move forward. So the bankruptcy is void, null and void. And secondly, our U.S. rights are ceded by our constitution, by our Bill of Rights, that they come from our Creator God, and the government just accedes to the fact that a republic protects the rights of the individual from the majority. It's not a democracy. <laughs> democracy is a demos, which means mob rule. And so what we have to do is they may chip away the Constitution in terms of the way the attorneys operate with administrative law. But in actual fact, common law, which is the British system of law we inherited to right back from the Magna Carta, is the basis for our common system of justice and law, legal precedent, the rules of evidence, the rules of the court and habeas corpus. And by removing... Uh, all these principles, they may do it operationally, but in fact, they, they don't have the authority to do so or to convert us to what we call corporate citizens of a body that we haven't accepted. So they may do all these scams. As I say, they're scamtastic, but they don't have any force in law because the Constitution is an operational act between the states, several and complete, and the so-called federal government. We'll be back in a moment with more. Gary Creep, I think we may have lost our connection, but we'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back. And uh, Gary, you seem to have a well-polished uh, legal crystal ball as to what you think may well happen in October surprise. Can you give us uh, some insight to our audience? And by the way, if you have any questions, do call in 800-259-5791. Uh, what do you expect to happen in that October surprise? And you gave some pretty shocking and uh, prescient ideas as to what may happen. Well, I think that uh, Mr. Obama will uh, promote massive voter fraud uh, through the funding of the, the various groups that used to be Acorn and now are called a variety of new names to sign up millions of, of of either dead people or, or illegal aliens or other convicted felons or other people that, that can't legally vote. Uh, and I, I think that's, and it's a two part 
do that. Number two is to file all these lawsuits using his Department of Justice to try to invalidate all the laws being passed by state legislatures, uh, some of those laws with, with Democratic uh, legislative support, uh, to cut down on voter fraud because uh, many people on both sides, on, in both parties, are concerned about voter fraud. Now, the Democrats usually are less because uh, of, for a variety of reasons, they involve well, I heard that the vote, the, the vote counting machines were just brought up by, by George Soros. So for the yeah, company that, owned, that does the vote counting electronically is now owned by Mr. Soros. Well, we funded, uh, we put about $25,000 into a, uh, um, a, pro a project in Illinois uh, called the Defend the Vote, which uh, uncovered massive uh, voter fraud in Illinois. I mean, we're talking about precincts where not only did everybody register to vote, but 120 percent of the number of people registered uh, actually voted. You know, right, which also and also people that are long dead. You know, anywhere from six months dead to many years dead. Yeah, you know, uh, I mean, it was just when, when roughly 50 percent of the people vote at any time in any election, if that, when you have 120 percent of the eligible voters voting instead of 50 percent of the eligible voters voting, that's uh, that's pretty significant. But I think that, I think Mr. Obama is planning some sort of October surprise. Now, you may remember that uh, North Carolina, the uh, Beverly Purdue, the uh, Democratic uh, governor of North Carolina, who's an avid Obama supporter, announced. Like Last year, uh, floated a trial balloon about the idea of postponing the 2012 elections because the economy is in such bad shape that it was, you know, the, the Congress and then the president should be working on the economy, not worrying about campaigning for election. That didn't fly very, hard, fly very high, but it also did not attract a lot of opposition. Most people just didn't even bother with it they, to to uh, uh, criticize it, which is kind of scary. My foundation did. Uh, we, we, you know, we went on the the airways and talked about it and there's people to oppose it but there wasn't a whole lot of reaction i mean you have to understand a lot of the people in the republican leadership in congress are all big government republicans and they agree with a lot of this big government stuff yeah, but the exactly. thing that, that you and i were talking uh, during during the commercial break was there has been a trial balloon floated recently where one of the states is talking about uh, con uh, using eminent domain uh, in fact, I'm sorry, it's the county. It's County, California. They're talking about using eminent domain to take over all the underwater mortgages in that county, San Bernardino County. And then the government would reduce the amount of principal, would decide how much interest could be charged and all that. Well, you know, I don't know if that's a trial. You know, California is a pretty heavily pro-Obama state. I don't know if it's a trial balloon or what. But that's kind of scary to me. If we have the federal, so if, if Obama wanted to get reelected, I could see this as a realistic possibility. He issues an executive order. He nationalizes or, or uh, by use of eminent uh, domain, takes control of, of mortgages in vast, in vast areas of the United States, uh, or at least the under, underwater mortgages. And basically, he either cancels them or he uh, says, uh, we're going to reduce the principal load in banks. You can only, or financial institutions, you can only charge so much interest. You have to reduce the principal by so much. You have to make the properties all right side up instead of upside down, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that would be devastating the economy, but not in the short run. In the short run, if people would be you know, just overjoyed. It could propel him to re-election, assuming he's was ever legally. Yeah, elected. but then the credit would, it would choke right off, almost like somebody from pressing your carotid arteries with both thumbs, and your brain in ten seconds dies. Yeah. Uh, well, the credit would literally choke off, and any business looking for credit would find out. Sorry, we don't have any money for you because, with Obama's stroke of the pen, there is no credit left. That's right, and I mean he would he would he would throw hundreds of thousands of people, maybe even millions of people, out of work. Banks would fail, lending institutions would fail, credit unions would fail. Anybody involved in in the uh, real estate market, uh, in as far as lending mortgages, would probably fail. And then when they went down, they all the other uh, financial institutions would be overwhelmed. But Obama wouldn't care because then he, that would give him an excuse to nationalize all the banks. And we'd have a lot of Republicans going right along with it because many of the like uh, McConnell and Boehner and all those guys, they're all big government Republicans. They want more power. They just want to be the ones to control it. Yeah, it they, yeah, they're not moving towards state banks like the Bank of California, like the Bank of, of, 
of North Dakota. They don't want to have individual state banks which are independent of this globalist scheme and the federal bank system. They don't want to have the idea that people actually have deposits that may not go poof, and all of a sudden, if, if something like this happened, over the next year or so, you'd see a massive devaluation of the dollar internationally, and the price of food and everything else that goes through the ceiling would have massive hyperinflation. Well, but, but Obama would be re-elected. That's all he cares about. He doesn't care about the country. He just cares about power. But he's, uh, he, he wants to. He has a policy to to turn America back into post-colonial America. That's the dreams from his father book, and his whole policy is to destroy America when he's finished. As he said to Mr. Medvedev here uh, here a month ago, uh, when I'm re-elected, I'll have much more latitude to to collaborate on all kinds of projects. Right. And like like uh, spreading uh, American uh, power over various areas of uh, the Middle East and Africa. I mean, he has been complicit in the uh, overthrow of Mubarak, who was uh, an anti Al Qaeda, anti Taliban American ally. Same exactly. Thing. I don't know why they did that. It's insane. The same way, the same way as uh, Mr. Assad who is attacking uh, al-Qaeda and Taliban, who are actually inside the country at our behest, paid for by NATO and by America, to actually try to overthrow a regime that is, in a sense, it, it, in a sense not necessarily friendly with Israel, but at a, like with Israel, with Egypt now, with the, the election this last weekend of, of Mr. Hosni, uh, we, uh, uh, Morsi, I mean, with Mr. Morsi, who is a, uh, what do they call it, a... Uh, uh, extreme Muslim uh, Brotherhood uh, uh, Mason, we're going to be dealing with a situation now where the treaties made with Israel are completely void. And the reason why they took Mubarak out is he wouldn't agree to an American uh, plan and a NATO plan to attack Iran and Syria. That's why they took him out. Well, they also took, and for all of his uh, sins and evils, Omar Gaddafi was another anti-Al-Qaeda, anti-Taliban Muslim leader. I mean, right. we're, not, we're taking, we're d replacing Muslim leaders, friendly to the United States, even though we may not think very highly of them. Right, but at least they're not, our, they're not our potential enemy, let's put it that way. We have another question from Richard in Washington. Uh, make it quick, Richard, please. Yeah, I just wanted to respond with the facts, uh, Dr. Bill. Uh, the Constitution was rewritten in 1847. Uh, it was a fraudulent document at that point because you can tell it was enumerated. That made it a corporate document. So that became dissolved when the corporation was dissolved in 1933. Yeah, but, but who was rewritten? Any legal authority are those people's on the board of directors of the Federal Reserve, if that's... Yeah, I know all those legal things have happened, but like any contract, you have to have both parties informed, so if all the states, which are the only parties to the Constitution, it's not the U.S. citizens. People think the Constitution deals with U.S. citizens. The fact is, you can't write up a contract unilaterally and not have the other parties agree to the terms of it, even if it's 150 years ago. So... Uh, yeah, you know, those are legal moot points that require I, what I call a whole panel of Supreme Court justices and people with a lot more legal experience and knowledge than I have. So, uh, in order to sort it out, what do you think, Gary? Like I said, uh, I don't have the background or, or the or, or the knowledge to deal with questions like that, so I'll defer yeah. to you, gentlemen. Yeah. yeah, I would say it's a, it's to say it's a Gordian knot. What we need to do is we need to act as if the Constitution and the Bill of Rights still are in effect, and they can't chip it away from our hearts, even though they try to chip it away from our law courts and by administrative law and uh, acts that are like you know executive orders and acts like the National Defense Authorization Act. These uh, abominations need to be neutralized, and we have to act as if we still have constitutional rights and the Bill of Rights and the rules of habeas corpus, et cetera. <coughs> With others acting in that manner, we're doomed. Uh, well, I agree with that. We have, you know, I think Obama is trying to set up a dictatorship in America. I, I sincerely believe that. I think he hates America. And I think, that, you know, and, and maybe I'm wrong. But he, that's I think all his he actions, he's just judged by his actions. You're a very straightforward person. We are here at Genesis and Neutral Medical Report. There's, all the evidence shows that this man is, hates every race. He hates America. He wants to make America a post-colonial country. He's not trying to bring up third world countries. He's trying to collaborate with globalism, which is going to reduce the world population. He's collaborating to, to foment a war in the Middle East that will bring us to the brink of World War III. Not good. We don't need more Obama, and we certainly don't need Romney doing no actions whatsoever. Maybe uh, if his vice president has a few clues and gets in the, uh, in the ring, we can get things moving forward. Back in a moment.